How's it going guys? As promised, I'm here with the Resto Shaman guy. It took a little bit longer to do uh, than I wanted it to just because I was sick last week and I wasn't really able to talk for very long without coughing or having to clear my throat and apologies if I have to kind of do that still. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into this. We're going to start with races. Races for Shaman, I would say you, you kind of just want to be Orc. You know, if you're Alliance, if you're Alliance, you only have one option, which is Draenei. Uh, if you're Horde, you have Tauren, you have Orc, and you have Troll. And for PvP, 100% Orc is going to be the best. Um, you die in stuns. If you can resist those stuns, you have a better chance of survival. Um, basically that simple. Uh, also, you do get a little bit of a healing throughput increase here. Uh, 143 healing, obviously, if you can uh, sacrifice having that Blood Fury effect on you, which is pretty nice. Also nice for snapshotting healing stream, which we'll talk about later. Um, spec. I will show you how I spec. Personally, there's three specs, about three specs that I've seen. Um, if you're generally a twos player and you feel like you struggle really hard when you get trained by warriors and by rogues, you probably want to play toughness. Now, I will say that I don't think toughness is worth playing if you're not hit cap. And I'll, I'll show you why. Um... So basically, I think that you want to be 3% spell hit, which is 3 hit gems and hit on gloves. Uh, I don't ever use healing wave, personally. 5 out of 5 totem focus is better than 1 out of this and uh, 4 in this. And the reason why is because ancestral healing does not actually work with healing grace. Um, so ancestral healing has no dispel protection, even if you're talented into this. I think it's a bug. Um, the reason why I think you need a 3% hit is because you can't afford to put talents in here. Um, so if you're playing the toughness build, you want spell hit on gloves, and you want th uh, three, eight hit gems. Some shamans decide, like say they don't like mana tide. Some shamans say they don't like purification. I personally like both. Um, I think this is a pretty well-rounded build. You have three out of three, three out of five nature's guardian, healing grace to try and protect your heroism, to try and protect your earth shield. If It's really awkward because you don't have many buffs to protect, but if you don't protect them with the spell uh, protection... You're just going to get flat out destroyed. If a priest presses the spell and gets all your stacks of earth shield off over and over and over again, you're just going to oom. So I would say this is the pretty standard toughness build. Um, if you aren't toughness, then you can go for healing on gloves and extra healing gems, which I generally do. I actually play a lot of twos and I decide to play away from toughness just because I think that deep resto is better. Um, and my theory behind that is, um, you just get more healing. And generally speaking, I feel like I lose more games to not having enough healing than I do to dying. Um, I think toughness is incredibly good versus warriors specifically. I think it's okay versus rogue, um, but it's really, really good versus warrior. And um, I don't really see myself dying to warriors that often, so I generally don't play toughness. So this is the, uh, the second build that I have here. Um, one point in Ancestral Healing for Dispel Protection, even though it's not covered by Healing Grace, just because you kind of have an extra point floating around. Um, and then there's another build you could do where if you're hit capped, you can do some, uh, some stuff like this where you can go for reduction in frost, fire, and nature. This is pretty good if you're getting killed by rogue mage. Uh, also helps if maybe you're a target in fives, you're dying to Ellie shamans, you're dying to mages and twos. This is good versus, um, the insect swarm druids, balanced druids, whatever, um, the Restokins, you know what I mean? Because uh, they do nature damage. But generally speaking, the build that I play is just the full Resto. That's the one that I like the most. It feels like you get the most healing out of it. Um, keep in mind that if you're playing this build, you're going to need hit on your gear again. So, yeah. I don't actually, like, I don't actually gem Brazil. I don't actually play Toughness. I like kind of balls the walls uh, full healing. And I would say I do pretty well with it. Like, you know, I, it's definitely better in fives, by the way. Definitely better in fives to have full healing because you're not really targeted that often. Um, twos, you're basically screwed versus Rogue Mage, but I feel like you're kind of screwed versus Rogue Mage anyway. So those are my three builds for Resto. Um, I guess try and pick which one fits like your play style, I guess, and what your needs are the most. Gonna go over my macros. Gonna try and go over them pretty quickly because if you watch any of my other guides, they're basically the same thing. Some of these are enhanced macros, so I'm just gonna kind of avoid them. Um, focus or Shock, rank one for focus. You could also have a full rank uh, Focus or Shock if you want. Um, I have a Arena 1-2-3 Shock, Focus Purge, pretty simple stuff here, Target Arena 1-2-3, Focus Arena 1-2-3, uh, 
Uh, nothing crazy there. This is just a weapon swap macro, but that's not the one I use. NS Chain Lightning, NS Healing Wave, pretty simple stuff. Uses my on-use trinket when I pop it uh, for extra healing. I don't have it macro to Blood Fury because sometimes you don't actually want to use Blood Fury. It might actually be really bad for you to do it. Stop casting on my Earthshock in case you're casting heal. Stop casting on uh, Rank 1 Earthshock. Focus Earthshock. This is the macro I use to swap my shields. If you th want to throw a main hand in here, you can just pretty simple just put two more lines in the main hand um so for example if you get a pv weapon you'd put it right after the pv shield and if you have a pvp weapon you put it right after this so let's just say you have like a weapon with mp5 so sometimes when i'm playing i'll put on my mp5 shield so pvp shield pv shield for mp5 just a little bit of a min max stop cast on grounding which i actually like i think it's pretty nice and surprisingly like my shaman really does not have that many macros that's kind of crazy um None that are, like, necessary. Just really simple stuff. No help harm macros like all my other characters. All right, so add-ons. Pretty common one I get is what's the add-on up here that shows, uh, you know, ticks of my tremor pulsing, ticks of cleansing pulsing, things like that. That's a really simple add-on. It's called Totem Timers. I'll take it from the top, though. Atlas loot's irrelevant, but if you want it, it shows the loot. Uh, details shows all the stuff over here. Fly plate buffs. This is a pretty common one. People ask me, like, how do you get, you know... The CC over nameplates or the damaging spells over nameplates. I'll go fly to a mob real quick, I guess. Fly play buffs, the one that people like. Item rack to swap your gear pretty easily. You know, you could also make sets. You know, I have a PvP, PvE resto. You can just kind of use that there. Omni bar shows my enemies' cooldowns. Uh, spell replay shows the last global that I used. I only use this for stream. I don't think this actually has uh, any effect for you as a player, unless maybe you are a streamer or you're recording your gameplay and you want to know what you use. Uh, weak R's, I have a few weak R's, none that are that important, I guess, except maybe this one. People like the loss of control. Here's the link right here. If you copy this into your browser, you can't really copy it, so you'd have to type it in manually. If you type that into your browser, that'll give you the weak R for that. Okay, so I'll just show you fly plate buffs real quick. Basically, long story short, fly plate buffs has CC over top their head, and also uh, your your debuffs and stuff like that. I'm gonna run away from this mob because I don't feel like killing it. All right, how to gear? How to gear is an interesting one, and I feel like you know every time I talk about this, it's gonna be different for every single player. You know what I mean? It depends where you're at in your gearing process. If you're a brand new 70 and you want to gear up from scratch, you're most likely going to have to start with the reputation gear. And then you're going to have to follow that with probably getting the Season 1 gear. Which means, you know, you're not going to be buying the Season 2 gear. You're going to be buying the Season 1 gear discounted. Just because you're probably not going to be getting enough arena points. If you're getting a lot of arena points every week, then maybe you can change that. But the difference between Season 1 and Season 2 gear is really not that big of a deal. Because I'm still using literally all Season 1. I have Season 1 in every slot of my PvP gear. But yeah, other than that, I think you should use 2-piece, two 2-piece. Two if you're playing a comp where you literally never get attacked, maybe you're only fives, maybe you're only threes is like a shadow play or something, where you're playing with wizards and you never get attacked, you can go four piece if you want the extra healing and you don't you don't feel it necessary to have that uh the loss of healing. I will say though, you generally are always gonna want Ellie gloves, um, because the increased range on shock is a really big deal. Um and then also in terms of how to gear, PvP neck is good, Prince Cloak is good. Um, the PvP Cloak is really bad, so you probably are going to want Prince Cloak or Badge Cloak. Uh, bracers are good from PvP. Also, there's an option of PvE Bracers from First Boss and SSC, uh, which aren't bad. But you want to make sure that you have like still a decent amount of Resil. I roll with 325 Resil. You can't see it right now. You can if I do this. So I roll with 325 Resil and unbuffed my healing is 1750, which is actually pretty freaking obscene, if you ask me. I think those stats are pretty absurd. Um, but you can see that I favor healing much more than Brazil, um, because I, like I said, I feel like I lose more to healing than to dying, uh, healing and ooming. Belt, I would say NG belt, and then if you, if you want, you can use the PvP belt. I don't really like the PvP gear that much on Shaman because there's no MP5, so I was using this, uh, the Kara belt, if I needed extra healing, and now I have the, uh, trash TK belt. Uh, Sunhawk leggings are absolutely insane. If you have them, you want to use these. They're crazy. They're from Kael'thas. Uh, tier 5 are also pretty decent equivalent. If you don't have either of those and you feel like you can't get either of those, um, you can get a pair of legs from Karazhan, from Chess. 
but the reality is since they have no MP5, you might just want to get PvP legs because I think MP5 is pretty important. And I'm like almost certain that the PvP legs have MP5. Um, these are from SSC. I think they're really, really good boots. 16 MP5. You can tell that I really like MP5. You oom super hard on shamans. If you can't get these and you don't raid, you can go for the PvP boots. But you want to make sacrifices where you can. Like for example, you know, try and get MP5 in other places. Um, PvP ring. This is basically Mag Ring, um, so Mag Ring is good. Um, if you have Band of Attorney, that's also really good. You want one of these PvE rings with MP5. You could also even use the uh, Badge Ring. It's really not that big of a deal. Uh, Essence the Martyr, in my opinion, is just the best trinket you're going to be able to get for PvP right now, in my opinion. I, I really like the on-use effect for NS, for snapshotting, healing stream. We'll talk about that later. Obviously, PvP trinket. Gladiator's Totem of the Third Win. Um, in my opinion, the best uh, totem that you're going to get. I use this one up until that point. This was from a quest in Nagran. I think you had to like do all of the kill stuff for like all the animals and stuff. Um, but yeah, you spam lesser healing wave a lot. So I do think that this was pretty good up until that point if you can't get it. PvP shield's insane. You probably want to buy season two PvP shield as fast as possible. I know I said the difference between season one and season two is not that big. Season two shield is big. You want to get that ASAP. Um, and then season two weapon. Long story short, um, you gotta get the rep blues and you gotta farm honor. You wanna go for two piece, two piece. If you don't get a lot of points every week, just go ahead and buy the season one stuff. It's not that big of a deal. You do get a lot of points every week, season two stuff. There's no way in which you should get stuff first. Just replace, you know, your worst item to your best item, I guess, or replace your weakest item, um, every week if you can. In terms of gems, some people, if you feel like you're dying a lot, feel free to gem for Brazil. Um, I try and hit every socket bonus in all my gear as long as it's not terrible. For example, the chest piece, terrible socket bonus. Four critical strike rating, throw that in the trash. But you can see Brazil here, Brazil here, Brazil here, you know, healing there. Um, you can see that I personally gem healing MP5 and healing intellect. If you want to gem Brazil um, because you feel like you're the target, that's completely fine. Uh, maybe it's like a comfort thing where I'm a little bit more comfortable surviving, but I think that... Uh, Personally, like I said, I think healing is a really big deal as Shaman. You don't really get to heal often, so when you do, you kind of want to pack a punch a little bit, in my opinion. Um, back in the day, I used to gem for Brazil. Um, I, I changed my mind completely. Royal Knight's Eye, um, Luminous, Noble. And those are actually the only two uh, gems I use, believe it or not. All right, so for Enchants, obviously Thralmar Rep, Aldor Rep, Exalted. This was Revered, 15 Brazil. 30 healing, 12 Brazil, 81 healing, hit here if you need that, if you're playing the other build, 66 healing on legs, boar speed on boots, uh, and if you are an enchanter, which we'll talk about in a second, you want 20 healing on rings, pretty simple in terms of enchants, professions, uh, my opinion, NG belt's really good, I don't use it all the time, but when I do, it's obviously pretty insane, uh, this is going to help you survive against rogue mage more than anything in the world, if you die to rogue mage a lot, you're definitely going to want NG belt, um, and then your second best is going to be enchanting, which is going to give you the healing on your rings. Your utility is a shaman, which actually makes you a real class because it's actually a joke that you have no instant healing. Uh, is shock, which is your interrupt, or shock is actually an interrupt. Grounding, which allows you to avoid CC and avoid damage, and purge. These are your three key points and highlights of being a rest of shaman. If you're using these effectively, you're giving value for your team. And if you're not using them effectively, you're basically useless. Reroll to a rest of druid. You want to use shocks to interrupt any cast you can. It's a, it's a super short interrupt. Whenever you're playing versus anyone, you want to just rotate um, shocks and ground. So it's, it's literally earth shock, ground, earth shock. You can stop three casts in a row. And you want to try and rip off buffs versus everything. There's Generally speaking, there's not a bad buff to Purge in Burning Crusade. Um, keep in mind that Purge is kind of expensive, so when you're when you're being offensive with your mana, you're going to notice that you're going to oom really, really quickly. But I can't stress it enough that you are going to need to use Shock, the Focus, the focus Shock macro I was showing you earlier, and Grounding to prevent your teammates from being CC'd or being damaged. Um, I play a lot of Warrior 2v2, and I am very vocal with my Warrior where, okay, I have next kick, I have next kick. I shock a cyclone. I I have next uh, I have next uh, ground. I have next ground. I ground a cyclone. I have next kick. I have next kick. I shock a cyclone. And then when I have no stops, not me, not me, not me. And I make sure my warrior knows that he needs to reflect. He needs to intercept. When you're doing all of that, you're actually going to realize like how much momentum you get. If you overlap a shock and like an intercept or a shock and a reflect, it's actually going to matter quite a bit. So you just want to be really vocal with your teammates on what you can stop. 
and just try and get in the habit of using that shock as an interrupt as often as possible. Keeping your enemy purged up as well is really important. Resto Druid and Dis Priest, two big offenders of having really powerful buffs, power shield, life bloom, reju, purging all that is definitely really good when you're being offensive. Um, sometimes pre-purging as well before you get to that offensive stage is also good just to kind of get off the trash buffs. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about your damaging spells a little bit. So we talk about shock a lot. Keep in mind that you can use rank 1 shock if you're saving mana, and you can use full rank shock if you want to do damage and interrupt. I actually cycle between both depending on the situation, you know? Um, if we're if we're actually damaging a target and I'm healthy on mana, I'll use full rank or shock to interrupt. Sometimes I'll use full rank frost shock to slow people. Sometimes I'll use rank 1 frost shock to slow people. You know, it really depends. Um, I would say one of the only damaging abilities I don't use, I use lightning bolt, I use chain lightning. Um, very rare, but I'll use Fire Nova. Very rare, you know, very, very rare. Yeah, one of the only things I don't use is Flame Shock. And the re the reason I don't use Flame Shock almost ever is because although it's actually probably your most efficient damaging spell or one of them, um, it puts you in a really awkward spot where you don't have your Interrupt available. Um, you don't have your Slow available. You can weave in an Earthbind if you need. Um, and generally speaking, it's not really great into a lot of things. So, for example... Never use Flame Shock into like a team that can just dispel it. For example, Priest. Literally just a waste of your mana. You're only getting half the value. When you're fighting against like mages and druids and stuff, it feels really bad to throw out a dot instead of interrupting a cast. So it's just, it's really hard to find a place where you use Flame Shock. I will say, 90% of the time I won't use it. The only time I've seen myself use it so far in this expansion is when I'm fighting Warrior Druid as Resto Shaman Warrior, and we just kind of have the Warrior Druid on the run. And the warrior is deed up and you know just full defense and the druid's not even trying to cast i'll throw an, i'll throw a flame shock on him that's the only situation i've used it so far uh in terms of chain lightning i almost never really hard cast chain lightning the only time i ever use chain lightning is when i ns it and that's like the execute scenario like you know what they're like under 1500 hp and it's chain lightning is going to kill him otherwise i think chain lightning's too expensive it's 760 mana a hard cast lightning bolt if i feel like i can uh, keep in mind, it will lock your nature tree, so not really the greatest thing to do if you feel like you're a little bit vulnerable, but same scenario, you know, if people are kind of on the run, I'll cast out some lightning bolts, and this is something that you're actually probably going to see pretty commonly used. I guess you can maybe use chain lightning as well in this kind of comp, but if you see people playing like Shadow Priest Mage or Shadow Priest Warlock, things like that, you are a very aggressive comp. You are you're basically all in. When you cast that Bloodlust, you kill your enemies before that Bloodlust is over, or you're probably going to lose. So using your damaging abilities of those comp as a Resto Shaman is really important, as well as your Purge. You know, you want to rip those off. Let's talk about healing and surviving. So Resto Shamans are very notorious for being absolutely terrible at surviving. It's just really awkward. You kind of have to rely on your partners a lot to keep stuff slowed, and you kind of just kind of waddle around a pillar and hope that they do enough pressure where... Uh, the enemies can't chase you around that pillar because they'll take too much damage. But um, in terms of surviving, there's a couple things um, I'll try and teach you here as well as uh, healing. So the first thing I want to talk talk about is snapshotting healing stream. If you're playing against any team that doesn't have a rogue, you're not using mana spring. You're using healing stream every single time. Healing stream is absurd. Okay, so we're going to drop a healing stream right now. It heals me for 138 a tick. All right. So that's effectively as much as one life bloom stack, but it's every two seconds instead of every one second. So it's about a half a life bloom. And a half a life bloom, and it could be on two people if you're in twos, three people in threes, and five people in fives. It's actually really, really good healing. I'll try and show you uh, a breakdown of my healing versus some stuff here. All right, so healing stream here, second highest healing. I feel like people don't realize how much uh, healing stream actually does. Um, it's free healing while you're interrupted. And you can make it more powerful. 23% of my healing here. And this was a 4 minute game. It's almost out healing Earth Shield. So healing stream is really powerful. And what I mean by snapshotting is um, your healing stream will keep the effects of all of your increased spell power stuff. So right now I'm at 1750 spell power. It's healing for uh, 138. I pop an On Use. I pop a Blood Fury. I pop a Wrath of Air. I drop a healing stream. And now it's ticking for... Looks like 172. Yeah, 172 instead of 138. So that's a lot of extra healing. So snapshotting your healing stream in TPC is really important. I snapshot healing stream in every single game. Um, I try and look for situations where I feel like we're going to be kind of stationary for a little bit. I'll put my healing stream behind a pillar. 
Sometimes I won't always Blood Fury depending on the situation, but I'll always try and on use Trinket and Wrath of Air. You can get rid of the Wrath of Air, obviously. You could like immediately redrop your uh, Wind Fury or your Grounding or whatever you want to do. But yeah, Healing Stream is really important. I can't stress that enough. Um, in terms of faking kicks, there's not much I can really tell you about faking kicks, all right? I will tell you that you want to try and be different with your pattern. Sometimes you fake late, sometimes you fake early, sometimes you fake in the middle. You don't want to be uh, easily predictable. But what I, what I will tell you about um, trying to fake kicks is the, the higher percentage HP you do it, the more difficult it becomes to kind of like recognize what you're going to do. And with this talent right here, Focused Mind, it's actually better sometimes to just get the kick out of the way. Like, when you get interrupted as a Resto Shaman, it doesn't really feel like it's that long of a lockout, okay? Uh, I will say that sometimes getting interrupted feels really devastating, especially versus mages, because you can't ground and you can't kick. That's what makes Rogue Mage so freaking difficult. But generally speaking, when I'm fighting against Warlocks, I'll literally cast all my Warrior when he's at 100% HP. Because by the time this cast finishes, especially with Curse of Tongues, he's going to be at 90, 80% HP or whatever. And if I get CS when they're at 80% HP, it doesn't actually matter. You know what I mean? So just cast early. Um, the longer you wait, the worse it's going to be. You know, don't be too afraid to get interrupted if people are at a high percentage of HP. And if you lose because of that, then tell yourself, okay, why do we lose? Because I got interrupted when you're 100% HP. Like, what happened? What went wrong? Um, you know, try and, try and figure that out. But generally speaking... Unless it's Rogue Mage, if I get kicked at a high percentage of HP, it doesn't actually matter. So in terms of healing, you you literally have one button. You know what I mean? You keep Earth Shield up on the person who's dying at all times. You keep Healing Stream down as long as there's no Rogue at all times. And sometimes, I'm going to be honest, even versus Rogue teams, after, uh, you know, I see situations where the Rogue's kind of playing, like, really defensive or, like, running away, trying to kite, I'll actually get rid of my Poison Cleansing Totem and drop a Healing Stream just for a couple ticks, you know what I mean? Because Shaman has no residual healing, so just getting a little bit of healing on both you guys isn't bad. Um, but yeah, Rest of Shaman, you keep Burst Shield up, and you use Lesser Healing Wave. Lesser Healing Wave is really good with the Gladiator's Totem of Third Wind, gives you uh, Dispel Protection, um, and it also gives you Resilience, right? So it's really rare that I ever Healing Wave. Sometimes I'll cast Healing Wave if I feel like, you know, there's nothing going on because I think it's just a little bit more efficient, but... It's really rare. You have two healing buttons. Rest of Shaman surviving is just kind of, like I said, a lot of it's up to your partners. If someone's on you for too long, you're most likely going to die. You need you need peels. Like, you need constant peels. And during those few moments of, uh, you know, relief, that's when you try and get your cast off. Um, one thing that I'll say um, first rogues is you, you poison cleansing totem a lot um, because it's a faster global. So poison cleansing totem is less mana than cleanse. 207 versus 177 as long as you're expecting a totemic focus and it's actually a faster global so i don't know if you know this but um totem globals are one second as opposed to regular globals which are 1.5 which you can see here um so using totem cleansing like spam poison cleansing versus rogues is actually really effective um effective way to get wounds off you need a lot of help you know like i said earlier try and cast heals high and sometimes you just got to get interrupted but yeah, there's, there's really not too much to talk about that. I will say that you probably most likely want that defensive positioning around a pillar if you're being trained. That way you're not like super susceptible, just kind of getting destroyed in the middle of the map. But yeah, there's not really too much I could talk about there. Uh, we also want to touch up on the uh, the rule. Do not ever under any circumstance watch Bean. That's a, that is still a rule. You'll lose rating as soon as you tune into a stream. Cooldown usage. Yeah, we have a... We have... That's right, guys. We have a entire cooldown we get to talk about here. Uh, you have Nature Swiftness. Awesome. Uh, when do you use Nature Swiftness? When someone's dying, I guess. Uh, it's not pain suppression, you know? It's, it's not really that amazing, but it's the only line of defense that we have, so... Uh, in terms of NS, I don't really know if I could tell you the best time to use it. Um, I will say, you know, if someone's low on HP and there's interrupts available, it's probably better to NS before eating those interrupts. If someone's high on HP, you can maybe tank those interrupts. And if you have time to cast out of the interrupts, that's great. And if not, then you have that NS to fall back on. Like I said, if anyone's below like 1500 HP, I'll NS Chain Lightning. I, I consider an execute, you know what I mean? I use NS Chain Lightning into Druids all the time because you have a small window to kill Druids and Twos. Um, but... You know, Warrior Druid and Rogue Druid, I'm using NS Chain Lightning half of those games. 
and that is not an exaggeration. So yeah, you can use either NS for Healing Wave or NS for Chain Lightning, depending on the situation. You don't always NS Chain Lightning, and when you use it, you better make sure they die, okay? So maybe you want to wait till they're like a thousand HP. And then in terms of lusting, like in 2v2, it's probably one of the only brackets where you don't lust immediately. Maybe that'll change as future seasons go on. But in fives and threes, as soon as you kind of engage in combat, nine out of ten times you're lusting. In twos, you probably want to wait for your... I assume that you're only playing twos with a warrior because I don't think there's... Oh, you could play with a ret. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you want to kind of wait for your DPS to call it for an offensive lust. Um, if not, you might need to use a defensive lust. Like, there's been times where it's Warrior Druid where my warrior didn't doesn't call for lust, and I'm like, dude, I got a lust here just to catch up. You know, don't feel bad about using a defensive lust in 2v2 if you have to. It's not the end of the world. Um, but there's not too much to talk about there. Just understand that it has offensive and defensive value. You know, don't, don't start dying in twos and, you know, be like, well, you know, you didn't call for the lust, so I didn't use it. You know, if you need to use it, you press it. Um, how and slash when to play defensive and how slash when to play offensive. So in Burning Crusade, you are a offensive healer as Resto Shaman. Like when you're playing defensive, you're probably losing the game. Um, maybe less so in twos than in uh, threes and in fives. I don't really know if it matters, but whenever you're trying to play defensive as a Shaman, you're waiting to get momentum, I guess, or you're going for a drink. So how do I explain this? Basically, if you feel like you're backing off as a shaman because you need to get a drink, that's fine. Um, or if you feel like you're kind of, maybe you're waiting for blind to come off cooldown, you have no trinket, maybe you don't have trinket, you'll have an S, you're playing defensive. You got to recognize those situations, I guess, where you can be, I guess, exposed with no trinket, no nature swiftness. And if you have momentum, sometimes it's okay to actually play offensive in those situations, but try and just recognize... I, I guess the only thing I'm thinking here is where you have no trinket, you have no NS, um, and you have no mana. Those are the times where you want to play defensive, but sometimes you still play offensive in those situations depending on how much momentum you have because Rest of Shaman is super momentum based where, you know, you're keeping Wind Fury on your red or you're keeping Wind Fury on your, um, your warrior. And this is too specific because in threes, you're basically almost always going to be pedal to the metal unless maybe you're a double healer threes and in fives you know fives is fives if you got to go for a drink you just tell your other healer freaking heal um so i'm kind of like leaning more towards uh twos right now in terms of the way i talk about this but um how slash when to play offensive is just obviously you're going to play offensive doing your lust in terms of offense it's just going to be purging making sure you're in shock range so this is actually a really important one understanding what the range is for 25 yards because that's the range on your shocks and making sure you're in that range like it is very common where you have to expose your positioning to push up which means you can potentially get cc just to interrupt people like when i'm fighting against uh you know mage priest for example it's a common comp we fight against in twos i gotta make sure i'm in that mage's face being able to shock being able to make sure my warrior is in range of grounding and um i guess yeah, I guess that's it. And then also Warlock Druid, very common in Warlock Druid. You know, let's just say, let's just say I'm my Shaman here. I'm in a nice little fancy pillar. This is my Warrior here. The Druid's all the way over here, and he's casting a Root on my Warrior. So sometimes I gotta be like, you know, got a Yolo in. I got a Warlock on top of me. I got no pillar. I get to kick the Druid, and you just try and get momentum based on that. Um, as a Shaman, you can't really play to outlast people. You can't, you can't play to not lose. So you actually do have to try and play to win which means you are going to have to play offensive more often than not. If you're playing Rest of Shaman defensively 100% of the time, it's not going to work. You, you need to you need to get in people's faces and you got to rip buffs off and you got to kick and uh, you know, you got to, you know, honestly sometimes doing damage is just good. I mean, versus like Warrior Druid, I like to right click a lot. And when I say right click, I mean just flame tongue, you know, melee. It, it actually does a lot of damage like genuinely. I'll go attack a mob so you can kind of get the idea of it, I guess. But also Searing Totem. Searing Totem is very good. Uh, totem placement. This is a pretty simple one. I would say 9 out of 10 times, um, you would prefer to have your totems behind a pillar. That is just uh, that is just a fact. Um, if you're super try-hard, you can like try and get all your totems to stack. I don't actually do that because I, I really I don't pay enough attention. But like for example, Earth is here. And then if you wanted to do this, you could put a fire there, and then you could put like a, a water here, and then you could put an air there. And what this would do 
is make it really annoying to kill your totems. I'm not this tryhard. If you want to be that tryhard, all the power to you. Um, but basically, yeah, it makes people... It makes it more difficult to kill your totems. You just manipulate the position. So Earth is top right, I guess. And then Fire is top left. So in order to get top left over there, you turn a little bit. And then you make that top left, right? And then uh, Air is back left, I think. So you turn this way. And then back left would go there. And then the other one is back right, I think. And then back right would go there. Um, the positioning is kind of important sometimes, just based on like this, for example. So I think Earth is top right, right? So let's just say I'm fighting a Warlock, okay? And this Warlock's trying to fear me, and I drop a Tremor Totem. Your Tremor Totem's right in his line of sight. But if you do this, and you drop the Tremor Totem, now it's not in his line of sight. You know what I mean? So Totem placement um, and the positioning of the way the Totems come out kind of important sometimes but like i said generally speaking you want to just drop it behind a pillar uh what is water top left or back right back right so yeah same thing here like if you were drop a healing stream here you can drop it here and you can be a little bit more careful with that also it's actually probably a pretty big deal with manatide let's just say you know you go behind a pillar and you want to drop a manatide this manatide's actually in his line of sight when this manatide is in the fucking is in the campfire and it's unkillable but no, you guys get the idea. But yeah, generally speaking, uh, Blade's Edge. I like to drop my totems underneath the bridge because the people on top of the bridge can't kill them really easily. Uh, Nagran behind pillars, runes of Lordaeron. Sometimes I like to drop them in the room and then play in front of the room so they can't get to them. Um, but yeah, just try and keep them from behind pillars, uh, especially the Tremor totem versus Priest and stuff make it difficult. Like, if you're to drop a Tremor here and the Priest is playing on this side of the pillar and you're here, if he fears you... He can't walk around the pillar and kill Tremor Totem fast enough most of the time. Tremor Totem kind of sucks. But you, you get what I'm saying. Uh, totem usage. I assume that you're always playing with someone with Wind Fury. I guess you could play threes where basically your air totem is your most powerful totem. This is this is pretty standard stuff, right? Uh, if you're playing with a warrior or rep pally, Wind Fury. If you're playing with like Shadow Priest, Warlock, you know, Mage, stuff like that, uh, Wrath of Air. Basically, if you're playing a Wizard Cleave, you drop Wrath of Air. If you're playing a melee stuff, you drop uh, Wind Fury Totem. One thing that is a very common mistake, one that we see Absturge use quite a bit, is he drops his Grounding Totem and he doesn't redrop his Wind Fury. I'm just giving him a hard time, not actually. But yeah, you got to just make sure that when you drop Grounding Totem, it uh, it replaces your Wind Fury. So you're going to need to redrop your Wind Fury quite a bit, as well as your Wrath of Air. Um, so just keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Earth Totem, if you're playing against a Warlock or a warrior that has fear off cd or a priest you want tremor totem down if you're not you're free to use earthbind to slow people you're free to use strength of earth to um give your warrior ret more damage and if you're fighting against a rogue without a uh, a fear on his team which is pretty uncommon rogue druid i guess you could even use stone skin if you want to reduce damage a little bit if you're fighting against a rogue ever poison cleansing totem super overpowered definitely want to use that one um healing stream if not uh fire totem you can use uh frost resist versus mages uh, for a long time i said uh I don't think Frost Resist Totem is that good versus mages. And then someone said, well, what about their pet? And if you can actually resist a pet freeze or the pet does less damage, Frost Resist is actually probably pretty good. But generally speaking, I use, I use Searing Totem. Searing Totem is actually really powerful. It's actually really good damage. You definitely want to use that. The only time I ever see myself using Fire Nova is like when I'm really all in. Sometimes I use it versus Rogue Mage because I don't care about the mana. Uh, I actually have never used it versus Warrior Druid, but I don't even think it'd be that bad in some situations. Um... What totems you don't need. So I will say that I don't have fire resist totem bound. And sometimes I fight against Palm Pyro Mages or Destro Warlocks. And I'm like, damn, I really wish I had that bound. But it's a water totem anyway. So I'll probably just use Healing Stream. So I don't have that one bound. Um, I obviously don't use Sentry Totem. Um, I think there's no use for that. Some people might think that there's no use for a Disease Cleansing Totem. Almost true. Almost true. But the reality is, if you are um, <clears throat> fighting against a Shadow Priest, or sorry, an Undead Priest that has Devouring Plague, it's the only disease in the game, but it's one that's worth dispelling. Uh, so you need dis Disease Cleansing Totem for that specific reason. Um, maybe that, um, maybe it could just be on a really crappy bind. Stone Claw Totem, generally speaking, gets really low value in PvP. If you don't want to have it bound, that's fine. Uh, sometimes you can use Stone Claw Totem to taunt pets, like... I don't know if it works on like hunter pets and honestly i don't even know if it works on elemental i think it does 
but it 100% works on like boom uh, trends from Boomkin, things like that, and it'll actually taunt the pets for a little bit. And sometimes I try and mess with people a little bit if they're just like spam killing totems, where I just drop a stone claw, and if they if they attack into it, they have a chance to be stunned for three seconds. So you know, I fight against priests who are like, I'm just I'm gonna tremor war them like this, and I'm just spam dropping tremor, and he's just right clicking it. Sometimes I'll actually sneak a stone claw in there. For a second and see if he attacks into it and maybe gets stunned. I've actually stunned people with that before. Uh, same with Druids if they're spamming rank 1 Moonfire. Um, I'm spamming dropping totems, they're spamming rank 1 Moonfire. I'll, I'll sneak down a stone claw totem, they might end up stunning themselves. Pretty low value. Someone in my chat said it also works on Shadow Fiend. That's actually really awesome to know. Searing totem, you definitely want. Magma totem, you're not going to use in PvP. You're not going to use it. Uh, I have Magma totem bound, but that's for PvE enhance. It's, it's just not going to happen, okay? Back in the day, I used to drop Magma Totem versus Rogues to get him out of stealth. I've not met a single Rogue in this entire expansion that opens in under 56 minutes, okay? They, they, they go in the gates and they sit in stealth. They're like, hmm, how do I want to one-shot this Shaman in this game? Should I Cheap Shot Kidney, Garot Garot, Gouge, MCS, Full Kidney, Cheap Shot again? Or should I Cheap Shot Vanish, Kidney, Garot Garot, hit him for 16,000? And then hit him with an MCS. And they just sit there and they ponder all the ways that they could win. That it's so difficult for them to open up. So you don't need Magma Totem versus Rogue Teams. Because it'll literally expire 4,000 times over before they decide to open. You could actually maybe use it to knock them out of stealth, I guess. If they vanish, you can maybe drop a Magma. It's like so unlikely to work either way. Um, in PvP, you actually can't use Earth Ellie or Fire Ellie. Frost Resist Totem has its place for some, what's it called? Grace of Air Totem is actually one that I almost never use in Arena. I used this when I played with a uh, BM Hunter. Let's kill this nerd. Screw you, Eleanor. Get put in my YouTube video, sucker. And then what else we got here? Nature Resist Totem. Monka S. Nature Resist Totem is one that I uh, don't use. Sentry Totem, like I said, useless. Stone Skin Totem, very small. Use Strength of Earth is actually not that bad. Uh, Windwall Totem is a not... Not nest, not needed totem. Mana Spring totem you actually use sometimes. I know you said it always use healing stream, but the reality is it's it's a really rare occasion in which you use Mana Spring. But basically the only time you use Mana Spring is if you're fighting against like a really low damage team and they're only doing single target damage, or if you kind of want to recover some mana. But just keep in mind that like it actually takes like if they're spam killing totems, you're not actually going to get mana back from it. Um, Tranquil Air Totem, obviously useless for PvP, and I guess that's it. And Totemic Recall actually has really good value in PvP. Number one, if you re-position like, in an arena map, you can Totemic Recall to get some mana back. Shamans are pretty bad with mana. Uh, also, one way that I notice it works really well is sometimes versus Druids, where my Warrior connects on him. I'll run on top of the Druid, or I'll run out of his line of sight, and I recall all my totems so he can't bear charge. That's actually really important. If you play twos a lot, and um, druids are getting away by charging your totems, you definitely want to use recall on them. Uh, weapon imbue, flame tongue weapon. It's just, in my opinion, always going to be the best one. Uh, mana management. There's not really much you could do here in terms of mana management. Um, I would say one of the only things you really can do is... Try and be in a situation where you're comfortable enough using Water Shield when taking damage sometimes versus uh, Earth Shield. Um, that's probably one of the biggest things I could teach you is that, you know, there, you're not going to need Earth Shield every single time you get attacked. Sometimes you're going to want to try and keep Water Shield up. So, wow, this guy's getting destroyed. This guy was at 30% health. This guy was at full. <laughs> Cheer him on. For the horde, man, I really wanted to, I really wanted to NS chain lightning this guy for the video just to show how much damage it did. But I, I won't grief him. But yeah, so just try and keep that in mind that sometimes keeping water shield up is actually going to be better than uh, earth shield. I notice myself water shielding a lot versus warriors. Sometimes you do earth shield though, uh, and then even sometimes against rogue. So it's actually uh, pretty good to keep that up. And then also going for good mana tide. Mana tide is five HP. Um, just be really careful when you use it. You know, it's not it's not insane, but Try and drop it behind pillars, try and drop it when people aren't close, um, and try and get, you know, a little bit of value from it, because it, it's it's pretty effective uh, if you get ticks from it. Downranking spells. So, which which spells do I downrank? Um, I don't downrank any heals, not a single one. I obviously downrank Earthshock, 
uh, I downrank Frost Shock for the slow. Someone asked me, do I downrank Flame Shock? I barely use Flame Shock. It's just the truth. I mean, if you want to rank one Flame Shock and you want to rank one Flame Shock Rogues to prevent restealth, the reality is they're not slow. They're probably going to get away. They're probably going to restealth in between ticks and open on you anyway. Like the the Frost Shock is going to be more valuable, to prevent him from restealthing, or the Earth Shock is going to be more uh, reliable versus the caster that they're most likely playing with. I, I don't know. I don't really just down. I don't. I don't down rank Flame Shock. I'm not saying don't do it, but uh, rank one Wind Fury I use. I know some people think rank two is better. That's fine if you want to use rank two, but just keep in mind that. The power of Wind Fury is the extra attack. It's not really the AP. It's just the extra attack for rage and whatnot. So rank one Wind Fury, in my opinion, is good, especially when people are spam killing totems or you're fighting against a team where you got to use grounding a lot and then you just kind of drop a rank one Wind Fury to save mana. If you were to play Healing Wave spec, which is maybe okay for fives, you could use rank one Healing Wave to buff uh, to buff the buff. Also, I didn't, I didn't mention this earlier. I don't play Healing Way. Healing Way is one of the talents, like I said, with Ancestral Healing that does not have any effect from Healing Grace. So even if you're expecting the Healing Grace, this has no Dispel Protection, which makes it kind of suck. Team Compositions, I would say you're pretty limited. You're pretty limited. So in 2v2, you have War Sham and Ret Shaman. In 3s, you have Ret War Sham. You have S Priest Lock Sham and Mage S Priest Sham. Uh, a comp that I play that's actually decently fun is War Mage Sham. Uh, I've also seen Rhett Mage Sham. And Fives, I don't even really want to talk about Fives comps because Fives, there's just so many combinations. But I would say these are these are the majority of your comps. Someone said Rogue Mage Shaman can work. I mean, it's Rogue Mage, so you're not 100% wrong. And generally speaking, I would just say that when you're playing these two comps, just understand that you're all in. Like, it's you know, you're just on a timer. With the Shadow Priest in both comps, once you zoom, you lose. So you have to play really aggressive in those comps. Finally, I want to talk about kind of like, I guess, some things that you want to recognize versus, uh, I guess, the individual classes 1v1. So let's just start with, um, I guess, hunters randomly. Uh, I've been on my mind. Uh, you can ground traps. So if you're playing with a warrior or ret, you can, when they go for scatter traps, you can actually try and ground those. Uh, the trap time is two seconds. So just make sure that you drop it like right when it's about to trigger um, to try and prevent your teammates from being CC'd. Um, poison cleansing, obviously to get off viper stings, and generally speaking, hunters and hunters will play with like a priest or druid. Just make sure you're in range to shock those people. If they're playing against a priest, you know, just have your tremor out of line of sight so you can play aggressive and not uh not get feared really easily. Uh Warlocks, Curse of Tongues absolutely destroys you. That's gonna be one where you really need that healing stream down. You gotta cast early, so if you get CS, it's not the end of the world. Um Obviously, Tremor Totem versus Warlocks. The one thing that I wanted to say versus Warlocks is just try and make sure you recognize where their pet's going at all times because some Warlocks are going to be really annoying and they're going to constantly send your pet after your totems and you're going to have to replace it. So just be, you know, pretty careful about that. Um, Warriors. Warriors actually have a pretty hard time killing rest of Shamans because you're pretty tanky. Um, just try and... I'm, I'm going to give you like a general rule of thumb here. If you're above 50% health, try and have Water Shield on so you don't oom. And if you're below 50% health, then swap on Earth Shield. Um, if you're Earth Shield the whole time, you're going to Oom. And if you can actually get away with Water Shield versus Warrior, from what I noticed, by just casting high, um, you're going to feel like you're infinite mana. And they're going to feel really frustrated that they can't hurt you. I will say, though, like when Warrior pops like Death Wish and on you string and stuff, feel free to put Earth Shield on, even if you're a high percentage of HP. Um, rogues, uh, like I said, you know, Poison Cleansing a lot versus Rogues. Like, a lot, a lot. Uh, one thing that I'll say versus rogues is just be really careful that they kick you and then they, they have the gouge and they have the deadly throw. So try and keep your front away from rogues. And if you see them backing off, you're going to have to fake deadly throw basically. So if you get kicked here and you're trying to recast and they're backing off, you're going to have to fake deadly throw. It, it's just the way it is. Um, what else do we have? Paladins. Who fights paladins? Try and ground hodge, I guess. Um, if they're holy, spam interrupt their heals, purge their buffs. If they're ret... Um, yeah, I think Rek can actually kind of maybe dunk on you. I don't really know. Someone asked what casting high means. Cast at a higher percentage of HP as opposed to a lower HP percentage of HP. Like, you want to cast when you're healthy as opposed to unhealthy. Uh, if you wait till you're unhealthy, then you're most likely going to die. Um, what class do we miss here? Warrior Rogue, Warlock, Mage. Mage, you're just... You got to use your utility to the best of your ability. Shock and Ground. That's all you can do versus Mage is to kind of set yourself apart uh, and try and you know, keep your team enabled. Kick poly, ground poly, kick poly, you know, kick shatter, ground shatter, kick shatter. It's just, 
<clears throat> it's just all you can do. Um, priests, pretty simple. Purge their buffs, kick their heals, kick their mana burns. You know, Tremor. I can't stress this enough, but positioning with Tremor is, like, really important versus Priest. So, you know, let's just say this is a pillar here. My Tremor is back here. I'm going to play in front of this pillar. Because if the Priest wants to fear me here, then my Tremor is safe. But if you're playing here, you know what I mean? It's really easy for him to walk over, death that Tremor, fear you. So I kind of try and play on the opposite side of my Tremor versus Priest. Um, helps out a little bit. And I miss anything. Other shamans, I don't really know what to talk about. Purge the Earth Shield. You don't really see Enhancer Resto. Or, sorry, Enhancer Elemental. Not in twos, at least. Purge Earth Shield. Um, try and purge your Bloodlust. One thing I'll say is Shaman v. Shaman Searing Totem's huge because uh, it'll kind of manually eat Grounding Totems. So if they have Grounding Totem down, Searing Totem shoots you. It goes to the grounding, gets grounding out of the way. Um, <coughs> Druids. There's not really too much I could say about Druids. Uh, some of the tricks that I've learned versus Druids is you can ground Nature's Grasp. So if you're actually like preemptive with that, um, you can ground Nature's Grasp. It's actually a really good way to keep your warrior aggressive. Um, but yeah, just Shocks and Ground versus uh, Druid and Purge is all really important. You know, your utility there. I guess that sums it up, boys. Well, I hope you guys learned something from this. Uh, I mean, I've been doing pretty well as Rest of Shaman recently. Better than I, I guess I expected to. Um, the Naru have not but yeah, uh, thank you guys very much for watching. Hope you guys uh, learned something. And if you guys ever have questions, you're more than welcome to always find me uh, at my stream. Thank you.